السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يعده الله فلا مضل له ومن يدلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم all praises due to Allah from whom we seek help and forgiveness. We seek refuge with Allah from the evil of our own souls and from that of our bad deeds. Whomsoever Allah guides will never be led astray and whomsoever Allah leaves astray, no one can guide. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, the one who has no partner. And I bear witness that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is his servant and messenger. يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون O ye who believe be mindful of Allah in the way that Allah deserves and do not die except in a state of full submission to Allah يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يتع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما ما بعد O you who believe be mindful of Allah. Be mindful of Allah and say what is right. Allah will bless your deeds for you and forgive your sins. And whoever obeys Allah and the Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, has truly achieved a great triumph. Assalamu alaikum again um, to everyone. Jamal uh, Mubarak to you all and pray that this uh, day finds you well and pray that this Juma finds you well as well. Um, so this khutbah comes in 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 a sense from a few different spaces, but it primarily comes from a post that uh, I wrote for a few years ago that was concerning the issue of othering or you know putting other people you know inherently different from us or as we understand them to me, but they are other than us. Um, and this issue of othering individuals who are different in either their faith or their community from ourselves, uh, especially within the Muslim community, and the harm that comes about from this type of othering. And so in light of the recent news of uh, the anti-Shia violence that is uh, that was um, that was perpetrated in New Mexico and Albuquerque, as well as the ongoing persecution that and the threats that were faced by the Shia Muslims uh, and the Shia community, um, as well as several other religious minority communities in several Muslim countries, such as Pakistan, um, such as Christians, Ismaili Muslims, Ahmadi Muslims, um, etc. You know, I feel that this was much that much of what was written a few years ago still holds very true for me at this juncture in my personal experience, but also that it may be a benefit in how we can come to see how we can rise above as a community, as people of different faith backgrounds, of different nuances and, and communities of belief, that how we can see the harm that we might perpetuate when we begin to take part in this othering. And as a as our community as a whole, that regardless of our nuances, we are still seen inherently recognizing that we are still seen as Muslims, as others by the society at large. And so how do we kind of see the harm that's being done to us collectively? And how do we uh, become more aware of that harm that we can perpetuate to communities that are minorities within our spaces here? And so we'll talk a little bit about that, inshallah. But like I said, we'll just go off of this post. But uh, before that, I did want to share that uh, th this past summer, I had the privilege to be able to go to uh, Germany and to go to Poland as part of a fellowship um, for a professional ethics study um, that used the Holocaust as a case study and example. Um, and what it did was what it did was help give insight to how the Holocaust and how it was perpetrated and how it came about through a variety of different ways and different complexities and nuances uh, was very relevant way to kind of study professional ethics in different fields. And so you know, we had a chance to uh, go to Berlin, uh, the capital. We had a chance to go to different concentration camps, including Auschwitz. Uh, got a chance to you know go around to some of the uh, historical sites, but also some of the uh, sites where a lot of harm was done, the neighborhoods where um, people once lived, uh, the synagogues or the places of worship people once worshiped in and uh, no longer were able to or were um, you know forced out of. And 
uh, even worse, you know, had their had their lives their lives taken from them. And so, see seeing that, you know, that the othering that not only took place gradually in that space, but also the results of it as well. We we saw the catastrophic results that are there. And so, um, what what made this experience a lot more impactful as well was that for me, prior to going to one of the concentration camps that was just you know, about forty kilometers outside of Berlin was uh, the concentration camp of Sachsenhausen. Um, and Sachsenhausen, you know, was a, um, uh, an earlier concentration camp. And when I did some uh, slight research on it, you know, a few days before we went, uh, it turns out that there was actually a Muslim that was, uh, in car that was um, imprisoned uh, in Sachsenhausen. And that Muslim was a Jewish convert to Islam. And it was just very interesting to read about how after the November pogrom, uh, the pogroms of uh, November um, in, I believe, 1938 or 1939, uh, you know, the, the, the infamous Kristallnacht, uh, you know, kind of, um, you know, pogroms that, that, that came about and uh, the night of broken glass, uh, you know, this, this gentleman, his name was Hugo Marcus, uh, I think he believed his, his, his Muslim name was Hamid or Hamid, um, and he was imprisoned, you know, rounded up as well. Uh, because of his Jewish ancestry and his Jewish roots. And he was arrested and, you know, detained in this concentration camp. And what was very peculiar about it was that uh, he was, uh, his, his, his freedom was negotiated at the concentration camp by a imam, uh, by a Catholic priest and by a Protestant uh, layperson that, that came together to um, help liberate this person. But, but it very much shows this aspect of this, this othering that this person is inherently other as well. You know, he's a Jewish convert. He's he's all these different things. Um, there's so much more to him that is there. But uh, despite being someone who at the margins there, who society has deemed, especially in that time for Nazi Germany, that if you have any affiliations with people who are Jewish, you should fire them from your businesses. You should not have them as your bosses. You should not have them as employees, you know, uh, kind of uh, rid yourself of them. Uh, for the for this person to have to have to go through that but then for the counter of it to be how he was liberated he was rescued he was he was uh he was his freedom was negotiated by people inherently maybe different from him you had a south asian imam you had a catholic priest you had um a protestant Christian, that all different uh, intersections who probably for their own well-being didn't have to go to that concentration camp uh, or, you know, risk their own lives in a sense or risk their own well-being, but they did. And the otherness of this person, this Hugo Marcus, the otherness of this person did not come into factor. Um, it was the uh, sanctity and the sacredness of life that mattered uh, and not his otherness. And so that's just a quick sh short few prefaces. And shall we'll have opportunity to touch base on more of these, uh, you know, down the line, but uh, inshallah, we'll transition to just this post. And uh, again, as it was intended then, it's intended now that whatever is of benefit, uh, please, you know, it, 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 it comes from a law and whatever is of its shortcomings is uh, comes from this humble self. But uh, the post begins, inshallah, as such that this post goes out and it goes to all my fellow Muslim siblings and Muslim community, but I do hope that its relevance is seen across religious traditions of any kind, that for much of my personal life, I've resided on the theological periphery within my faith. This faith identity was one that brought me a community, but it also brought me a variety of challenges and struggles that I personally could never have imagined uh, because I was personally viewed as someone outside of Islam because of my faith tradition. I would be limited in positions I would aspire to in Muslim organizations. I would be denied even being a candidate for some positions, um, uh, for, for some jobs that uh, that I was considered not as a real Muslim. And so I wasn't able to uh, obtain those. Uh, mosques during Ramadan would refuse to participate in food drives or any kind of relief efforts organized by myself or my community because they couldn't see themselves partnering with not just non-Muslims, but those whom they would label as outside uh, the pale of Islam entirely. These and many others, all because I was to them not a Muslim and hardly even a human, rather more so just a other. Recently, I've seen this rhetoric come up once more, the need particularly from those who consider themselves within the orthodoxy to somehow make it clear that we must deal with these issues. 
these others, not by first challenging their own preconceptions and misconceptions uh, about these individuals, but by making sure that they can sleep easy by partitioning their faith, much like the imperial entities that we know all too well did so to their own homelands, demarcating who and what these others are, because these labels and boundaries are what make us comfortable. They they keep us in our cushion zones. They they don't allow us to get corroded and 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 to encounter um, and to challenge ourselves. They get us too comfortable. The fact that we must label people, label label people who profess that they're that they themselves see themselves as Muslims. The fact that we must go to that extent to label them as non-Muslims before we even say any word about them as human beings or of their beliefs or who they are or what they have experienced, where they're coming from, what what stories do they have to share, what value and contributions can they bring to the table? We It says more about ourselves and our values than it does about those who we other, uh, those who we other through our rhetoric and our general approach to not just faith and interfaith matters, but with respect to spirituality as a whole. So if we, in justifying the othering of these, these individuals or these communities, say it is because we know that we are in the right and that they are in the wrong and that we are going to earn salvation and that since they are in the wrong and damned to hellfire, have we not already violated the very principles we seek to uphold? Imam Ali once taught that if a person is not your, uh, your brother or your sibling in your faith, then they are your equal in humanity. That regardless of uh, if they aren't the same religious affiliation of you, that doesn't diminish their humanity any less, that you should treat them as any less because they are different from you in that aspect. If the Prophet Sallallahu his companions and the noblest of Muslims worried about their own afterlives and the fear of not being in the company of God after death, what does it say about us when we boldly claim that we are destined for heaven and those whom we deem as other or not or as non-Muslim are not? Tell me that beyond creating an alien, unwanted and blemished perception of someone, that if you call them, label them as all these, beyond creating that alien to them, beyond creating this unwanted, blemished perception of someone or even of a whole community, what good does it do? What good does it do to introduce those around you to this person or to this community as first off being fundamentally and irreconcilably irre irreconcilably outside of the faith before you even talk about who the, what their name is who they are where they're from you know what what, what what's their background what kind of a first impression does that give to the people around that person what does that do to the person whom you're labeling, whom you're saying that about? What does that say about their self-esteem? What, what does that say about their personal value that they're assessing? What, if any, positivity can come from such a demarcation at the onset of such an introduction or discourse to a group or community of individuals who are already marginalized? Does this not instantly foster a negative perception marked by a false sense of superiority and thus inferiority on those deemed as other. I completely understand the need to do one's best in defining theological and faith parameters. Yet, when that involves you doing so, you doing so for the other person or the persons or the group of people or the community, when they didn't ask you to do so, there is an inherent issue here. There's something wrong here. I've got no issue with someone believing certain individuals or groups of people are theologically not Muslim in, or in what they understand as Islam because it, it just does not add up from a creedal standpoint. It just doesn't make sense with respect to some of the, the basics there that from a technical standpoint, it, they, you know, they wouldn't match that, that category. That's fine, you know, in a sense that you, you, you have the right to make to have that belief. And I'll happily even defend that person's right to have and hold these beliefs. However, I feel that it is very responsible step to in discussing with impressionable followers that in discussing with impressionable followers and individuals who take faith matters quite seriously to lead off any mention of a group by instantly declaring that those individuals are fundamentally other and outside of that which is mainstream. This can and it only does breed negativity and more often than not physical, sociopolitical, 
emotional violence and psychological violence and terror against those who've been deemed as others. Case in point, Google minority persecution in Pakistan or any other Muslim country, and you will see what exactly I'm talking about with respect to what this kind of rhetoric breeds, that beyond the fact of having a conversation of what theologically may uh, you know, count with respect to what we consider uh, as Islam and what we may define there, when it gets to that point where you start to speak on behalf of other communities, when you start to label other communities, when you start to tell your community about what this other community is and what they're not, without bringing them into the table, without bringing them into that room, without getting to at least know them or shedding light on their humanity, uh, when you just throw that label on them, and that's the first impression people have, there's where you uh, encounter a very slippery slope that leads to very destructive consequences. And a scholar can have many ijazats, many uh, degrees in their faith tradition as may, as they might like, as they might be able to attain. But if that scholar does, uh, if they make such definitive and bold claims without having even spent a single hour or any amount of time genuinely with those who they deem as other apart from their texts, I personally don't feel that they have the necessary qualifications to speak about that group or to make any claim about that group or that person, which creates such broad sweeping implications and impressions amongst the community that ultimately causes an immeasurable amount of harm, both to those people who've been indoctrinated, who are in the audience, who are in the congregation, and to those who are suffering because of such indoctrinations and such impressions and such misconceptions that are being strewed and labels that are being strewed. So if you want to know what Shia Muslims really believe, how they theologically and politically view the world and interpret their own tradition, go to a Shia community and consult with the appropriate sources. Talk to a Shia alim, talk to a Shia Muslim, ask them what their experience has been. Don't just go and ask a imam who might be a Sunni, who might be a Ahmadi, and just say, hey, what do Shias believe? And then just, that's your only way of understanding. Or if you're a Shia, don't just go to a Shia alim and say, what does a Sunni believe? Or what does an Ahmadi believe? You know, you have to go to the, the margins. You have to go to the people to find out what they believe. Otherwise, you will get a very skewed answer. So if you want to know more about Ismaili Muslim philosophy, theology, practice, or Ahmadi, Christian, Jewish, Sikh, Hindu, atheist, or any other faith or non-traditional beliefs, worldviews, houses of worship, etc., go to the source and consult with them directly. I'm sorry, but Orthodox Sunni scholars in this aspect have earned and continue to earn a F when it comes to knowing in depth, not just how, what other faith traditions and communities within and outside of Islam believe, why they believe what they believe and what experiences they've had, especially if they are minority communities claiming to be within the umbrella of Islam, how they've been persecuted and how that has shaped their worldview and theology and so on. That scholar what, regardless of, as we said, how, how respected, how educated that person might be, would benefit as much as you or myself from these meetings with other faith traditions, leaders, and members. Just trust me that how much more they would be able to learn and how much more they would be able to be shaped in their worldview rather than to be going into a space and just speak for that person and not thinking about the effects that that might have. The rhetoric that the person who uh, takes the lives of these of these men in Albuquerque uh, because of their names or because of their uh, their Shia uh, affiliation and, and identity or the people that uh, over overseas will continuously, continuously terrorize Shia masjids, will, will car bomb outside of Juma, will do all these different things, attack to Shia schools and 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 the people who uh, will will raid different Ahmadi masjids and all these different things. All these things happening. The the pulpit is where where this happens. The rhetoric happens here that the Imam can just say, "Oh, I was just claiming to, uh, you know, just making a scholarly opinion. I was just just making a distinguishin uh, distinguishment. I was just doing all these different things categorically, but." Uh, I'm not culpable for anything. I have a Pontius Pilate moment where I wash my hands. I'm not culp capable or culpable of uh, anything uh, negative that my followers will do there. No, you are absolutely responsible for that because uh, how you convey this, how you talk to, how you relate to other people directly influences 
how your congregants will see other people and what they will ultimately do. So if we want to truly establish a society of peace, if we want to truly establish a society of tolerance and respect where people don't go and, and commit these heinous atrocities just because someone else is different from them or that they see them as a non-Muslim or a kafir or someone who's, uh, you know, wajib al qatul or someone who's outside the faith of Islam, that you need to be able to bring them to the table, show them that honor and that sacredness. And that's what kind of that story that we shared at the beginning tells us about in the sense of three different individuals going to a concentration camp to save someone who of Jewish ancestry, of Jewish roots, of Jewish identity, uh, converted to Islam. They could have had nothing to do with him, but because they knew who he was, they brought him to the table. They had those interactions. They had those friendships. They knew beyond their religious delineations and traditions, they were still humans. And they understood in that moment, a human life matters more than anything else right now. And they went and saved that life. And as the Quran says, whosoever saves one life, it's as if they saved the life of all of humanity. So taking that into perspective. So we have much to learn about one another beyond our respective shared and differing beliefs what are uh, what our what are our lived experiences as individuals claiming to be muslims or non-muslims how does this affect our worldview and our daily lives how does it affect our relationships with those around us how does our faith tradition inspire us to be within our community more importantly what can we learn about our own faith from those who interpret and live it differently or live there, have a faith that teaches them uh, to live life very differently. These questions and all others fundamentally close when we begin the conversation, not with a greeting of peace or with a listening ear or with an air of respect, but with a premature tendency to immediately cast someone who is of another community or another uh, belief that is fundamentally, fundamentally different and other, and we put them into a box that we are, we are separate. We put a wall right between us that they are other and they are separate from who we are, or they are wrong, we are right. And so if we do so, we fail to explore uh, we ever we fail to ever explore the conversations which might enhance they might enhance our appreciation for our own faith that as well as god's work within the world as a whole around us we fail to see the beautiful spiritual parallels that a sunni muslim might see in nabuat or an ahmadi muslim in khilafa or a shia a shia or ismaili muslim in imama and wilaya we fail to see how the countries we hold near and dear to us and we are very proud uh, you know um whether you know ancestors of or diaspora members of or whatever it may be that we that we hold dear to us here that like pakistan um were first put to the paper by those who we currently now deem as others that that the constitutions of the likes of Pakistan were drafted by the likes of an Ahmadi, that they were championed, the, the idea of the nation and the creation of the nation was championed and voiced by someone who was a Shia or brought to fruition by a pluralistic faith leadership and cabinet of diverse Muslim and non-Muslim backgrounds. These and so many other examples become buried and discarded, disregarded because we are told that these people and these communities are not what they claim to be at the very onset of our introduction to them, uh, and that they're inherently others, that we should mistrust them or we shouldn't uh, rely on them. We should stay inherently uh, distant from them, that it creates this mistrust that we don't even want to dive into these spaces. And trust me, as someone who has lived my entire life within the Muslim community, within the Sunni Muslim community, within the Ahmadi Muslim community, in different settings, it is those who do not even share the same beliefs as you who will teach you the most about your faith and your own faith and how to improve your relationship with God. Oftentimes, it's the folks around you, not even the folks within uh, the, the same house. So as we conclude here, that as mentioned, I've got no personal issue with someone in defining their own faith parameters and theology, what constitutes faith and what is Islamic for them or what is not, and what certain beliefs, practices, or theologies they feel consist of that Islamic framework. However, I do take issue with these individuals feeling the need to not only speak of those who are already deemed as other by the orthodoxy, but to do so in a manner that only reinforces and bolsters a negative, divisive, and condescending mindset towards those who are already on the periphery, clinging for survival, having to watch their back and keep uh, you know, they, they keep looking over their shoulder that somebody might do something to them. Uh, I guarantee that this same fear of uh, worrying about a car bomb or something like this happening outside of a mosque or being targeted uh, because you might say the, the kalima or you might say something as, uh, you know, in, in, in a violation of some 
uh, some accord or whatnot that might be there with respect to impinging on your faith or infringing on your faith, that this is oftentimes not felt within the orthodoxy. The orthodoxy and the mainstream oftentimes feel this when they're in a country outside of that and say, hey, we've got Islamophobia, that Muslims are uh, in, in the crosshairs of people. And while that might be true, see that this should te be a teaching moment that how does it feel to be in the crosshairs? How does it feel to be in the crosshairs of uh, in the periphery of a society where you are 1% or 2% of the population? And now think about that community that is 1% or 2% of your community's population and think how you might be perpetuating the harm that you're complaining about someone else doing to you. So God is not just in these spaces where doors are closed and esoteric books are being read and khutbahs are being given, knowledge is being built up, yet one's own humanity and care for others remains stagnant. God is not just in those spaces where people come to be educated and about matters of faith, yet walk away having learned how another group are fundamentally other and therefore lesser and therefore doomed for hellfire. Rather, God is in those spaces and in those places where faith is called into action, where you are called to build that bridge and to build that connection to know one another. As uh, the Quran tells us that we've created you, different tribes, different people, different nations, di diverse in your creation so that you may know one another. And that as Muslims to come together, Muslims, hold firmly to the rope of Allah and shed aside these, uh, the, these, these uh, disparities, shed aside these things that are holding you apart from Allah. Uh, reconcile with one another, come together at the same table, that Allah is in those spaces, that Allah is with the activist in Pakistan who amidst a mob of individuals calling upon him to call the likes of Ahmadi's kafirs to refuse to do so because he sees the unnecessariness in doing so in a country where a majority of the people lack proper electricity, health care, and social mobility. God is with those people who, out of respect for their Shia siblings, empathize and learn about the massacre of Karbala. They empathize and learn about the martyrdom of the Prophet's grandson, Imam Hussein. And rather than ignorantly blast posts of Happy Islamic New Year to their friends or just saying, hey, why are you not fasting? Like you should just be fasting without under, un, any, any semblance of understanding the significance for what this heavy time might be for someone else. And Allah is in those spaces with those people who suffer, those who are persecuted, the downtrodden, the mustadafun, because of the very people who claim to be doing God's work and removing any perversions or discrepancies from religion by persecuting those whom they've deemed as other while foolishly thinking themselves to be God's righteous warriors. Brothers and sisters, in conclusion, our life on this earth is but a fleeting moment. Our relationships with one another are even shorter. Our life after death is eternal and is what matters. Rather than sparring over arbitrary labels and fundamentally othering and dividing ourselves to the point of animosity, suspicion, despise, and harm to one another, and in turn reducing that which we could draw from this life, let us instead make the most of this life and the next by being the best that we can to one another. That learning to not just love one another, but learning to be uh, the same members of our family that, that Allah tells us that we are, that, oh humanity, we created you from a single soul, from a male and female, and we spread you throughout the earth, and we multiplied you throughout the earth, that you have that same origin. We are all internally connected in this way, that regardless of our faith traditions, and hope that, inshallah, our creator will show us such love, and show us that mercy, show us that compassion that maybe we we, we came short upon, but let's try and do that to, and, uh, to, to that extent, because we know Allah will show it to an immeasurable degree more in the life to come. And Allah knows best. But as, again, Imam Ali taught, that if someone is not how you define as equal in your faith, or is not the in the same religion, is not who you categorize to be as someone within your faith tradition, or is not a Muslim, non-Muslim, Christian, Jewish, whoever they might be, that regardless of that label, that person is still your equal in humanity, and Islam tells us what we need to do, that we are responsible stewards of humanity. We are the best of people raised for the good of humanity. We are the best of people that are raised not to cause discord, not to cause oppression, not to hurt, not to transgress, but to be people who bring others together, 
but to be people from whom, as the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi tells us, that be people from whom your, uh, your hands and your tongues, these people are safe. That you are the type of people that when people see you, they know that they are safe from you because you are not harming them. So inshallah, may Allah guide us all to the right path, the path that Allah has bestowed upon uh, if those with, uh, has given those favor uh, and not of those who have incurred Allah's displeasure. We ask Allah to unite our hearts, to remove the seeds of discord and to plant and to foster the seeds of love and mercy and unity within us. And we ask Allah to allow us all to live up to the aspiration of a true ummah. We ask Allah for us to allow to be make amends for any wrongs or harms that we have done in the past and that justice, comfort, and care be bestowed upon those who we have wronged and that we can reconcile with one another and that we can be better, inshallah, for what is to come. And we ask Allah, as always, to allow us to leave this Jummah, inshallah, better than we came into it and to make for us from this effort, to make from us from these transgressions we might have committed, our sins, our mistakes, our positives, uh, the good that we've done, to make all of these things opportunities for us to continue to do better, to grow, to purify, and to be excellent. For Allah loves those who purify themselves. Allah loves those who better themselves, and Allah loves those who excel and work towards and strive towards excellence. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama salaita ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim innaka hamidun majid. O Allah bestow your favor and blessing upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As you bestowed your favor upon the Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam and send blessings upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and upon the family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as you sent blessings upon the family of Ibrahim salam and among the nations. You are indeed worthy of praise, full of glory. Rabbana taqabbal minna. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka antasameer al-alim. Rabbana wa taqabbal dua. Our Lord, accept this from us. Indeed, you are all hearing, all knowing. And our Lord, accept this dua from us. Accept this prayer. May you accept. Ameen. Jazakallah khair, brothers and sisters. Again, just uh, take this time to reflect and at the least what we can do, try to get to know someone, try to get to know someone, just even reach out. Um, we, we are in a connected age, a very super connected age to be able to even just connect, say hello, say salam, log in, just going outside our bubble and you'll see the world of a difference it makes, not just in the social aspect, but in the spiritual aspect to become and get to know people and see how other people appreciate Allah so that we too can appreciate Allah in an even stronger way. Jazakallah khairun, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.